the last few years, every so often I've made various Sonic videos covering the entries of the series on each of the handheld platforms it's appeared on. Game Gear, Game Boy Advance, DS, etc. Not too long ago now, I finally tied up the last bit of loose ends and wrapped the series up with a bit of a hefty video on all the games that were either one-offs or existed on weird platforms. Since I've now covered what I hope is every dedicated handheld Sonic game, I can finally put them all together in one giant mega video, covering every single Sonic game on every handheld he's appeared on. If you've never seen them before, this would be the video to watch. And if you have seen them before, or maybe you missed a couple, I put this one together so everyone can see it all in one place. With that being said, let's check out the journey I've had across all the handheld Sonic games. But first, before we get into all that, I want to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, Southern New Hampshire University. Have you guys ever thought about creating your own game? I know I definitely have. Actually, as a kid, it's the thing I always said I wanted to do. Fast forward to now, and even though I'm doing something video game adjacent, I always wondered what it would have been like if I had gone that route and made a game. If my previous upload is anything to go by, it's probably unsurprising to say I always figured I'd make some kind of precision-based action platformer in the vein of something like Mega Man. Maybe with some precise platforming mechanics not dissimilar to Celeste or Super Meat Boy. Now there's no doubt in my mind that plenty of you that watch my videos have the same desire to get into game design as I did back in the day, but maybe you don't really know where to start. What if you had the knowledge and experience to make your game a reality and turned it into an actual career. If any of that sounds enticing to you, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Southern New Hampshire University. SNHU has one of the largest accredited nonprofit online degree offerings in the country. They feature over 200 degree programs focused on getting you started in or advancing further in a career you'll love. In SNHU's game development program, you'll learn how to create realistic, dynamic gameplay experiences with game AI, physics, 2D and 3D graphics, and interface design. You'll also learn programming languages like C++, C Sharp, and Java, as well as 3D modeling and texturing with game art software. These courses are taught by industry experts who will teach you how to research, develop, and contribute to advances and trends in the field of game development. All of SNHU's programs are super flexible, with no set class times, allowing you to work when you want. If this sounds like something you'd be interested in checking out, go to snhu.edu slash gillythekid, or click the link in the description to get the ball rolling towards a new career path. If you've been on YouTube for more than three minutes, you'll probably have seen a video or two centered around Sonic. He gets talked about quite a bit online, whether it be in criticism or defense of him or his games. There's always a lot of Sonic talk going around, but one thing that doesn't get talked about all that much are the 8-bit entries in the series. Shortly after the release of the Game Boy, Sega came out with this gigantic monstrosity, and what better way to boost sales than to throw their spiky blue cash cow onto the system. Despite the success of the home console games, Sonic's outings on the Game Gear don't seem to be remembered in the same light as Mario's were on the Game Boy, much less talked about at all. So today, we're going to take a look at every Sonic game that's available on the Game Gear. So, the first Sonic game released for the Game Gear was titled Sonic the Hedgehog, but despite sharing the same name as its 16-bit cousin, it's not at all the same game. It shares some of the same zone names and has similar level assets, but save for Green Hill Zone, everything is different, even the music. The stage designs are completely different, and I actually think I like the Game Gear version soundtrack better. The Game Gear and Master System sound like garbage and nothing beats the Genesis sound chip, but I actually think the compositions here are more catchy. That being said, I think I overall like this game better than actual Sonic 1. Not that that's saying much. Spoiler, I don't like Sonic 1. I didn't need to play through the whole game for the video, but I found myself wanting to actually finish it, so I did. The game seems like it should suffer from screen crunch considering the hardware that it's on, but for the most part, I found no real issues with seeing what's in front of me. The controls were a little sloppy, but overall it plays well and it's a pretty fun time. The only issue I kind of had was in Skybase Act 1, you have to platform around all these periodically flashing electric currents, and it was getting pretty frustrating. Other than that, I have no real complaints. This one gets a pass. Sonic 2, on the other hand, does not get a pass. I had this game when I was a kid, and I hated it then just as much as I hate it now. Now, Sonic 2, the Genesis version, is my favorite video game of all time. I never went into this game thinking it would live up to the standard that I hold that game to, but this doesn't even come remotely close. Forget everything I said about the lack of screen crunch in Sonic 1, this one is the complete opposite. You can just tell from the start of the game that something is just off. Instead of the friendly, green, inviting scenery typical of a first Sonic stage, you get this 
poopy, dull background with set pieces made of cinder blocks and steel. The music is also, despite not being fitting for a first stage, totally fitting for the ugly setting we're abruptly thrown into. The controls in this game are way touchier. It's extremely difficult to see what's in front of you, so I wouldn't even recommend running at full speed, and this is the first time I've ever actually beaten the first boss because, as a kid, I couldn't get a hold of the slippery controls at all. My favorite part of Sonic 2 for Game Gear is how the game just throws random mechanics at you that aren't explained and don't work. Take this hang glider, for example. It feels like it should control like the cape in Mario World, but uh, it doesn't. I tried like 50 times and I still can't figure out how you're supposed to use this thing. It, it straight up just feels bad. The game also throws you into this one section where there's a bunch of clouds and some of them are platforms, but some aren't. But they all look the same and there's no way to know which ones have collision and which don't. This is a mess. So this one's probably my favorite. It's called Sonic Chaos, and in this one, you can actually play as Tails, so we're doing that. Sonic Chaos is on the easier side, like the way easier side, but for some reason ramps up in difficulty like halfway through the game. It's still relatively easy, but the difficulty spike was pretty jarring for me, just from like a pacing perspective. The music in this one isn't what I'd call amazing, but it's relatively catchy and totally inoffensive. The stages are all pretty well designed, and everything is wholly original for this game, which is pretty cool to see since this one doesn't have a 16-bit counterpart to be juxtaposed against. The controls are also way better than the first two games. There's also a lot more loops and springs in this one, so the overall speed is more in line with what you'd expect from a console title. If you're gonna play any game I talk about in this video, play this one. Alright, so I guess this technically counts despite it not including Sonic and really just being a reskin of another game, but Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine is a reskin of Poyo Poyo featuring, for some reason, the version of Dr. Robotnik and the Badniks from the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. I never really understood why they went with those designs and not the ones from the actual games, and that was always strange to me. This is basically just a handheld port of the Genesis game. It's really hard to mess this one up, it's Poyo Poyo, it's super fun, I'm super not good at it. This game does have a training slash tutorial mode though, so that's kind of neat. At the end of the day though, it's just Poyo Poyo with a sonic coat of paint. If you're a fan of Poyo Poyo, this is worth a play. The music isn't great though. When I was a kid, I used to pop Sonic Spinball into my Genesis all the time. The game wasn't very good, but the music in the first stage was super catchy and I liked the concept of the game. So I'd turn it on, play till I inevitably got a game over on the first stage, and proceeded to take the game out and play Sonic 2. It wasn't until only a few years ago that I found out there was actually a port of Sonic Spinball for the Game Gear. It's terrible. The original version already didn't control super great and felt kinda slow, but this one? Oh, this is, this is bad. All the physics just feel very wrong, and Collision feels super weird too. It's hard to explain in words, but Sonic just doesn't do what I expect him to do. The pinball physics just feel super finicky, and the frame rate seems weird as well. The music isn't good either, and all the scenery isn't interesting to look at, since most of the detail they put into level assets in the console version have been pretty much stripped. This one belongs in the big old dumpster. So here's a game we never actually got in America. It's called Sonic Drift, and it's basically Sega going, uh-oh, people really like Mario Kart, what do we do? Better make a subpar racing game with most of the fun aspects of Mario Kart absent and shove it onto our handheld system. That'll stick it to Nintendo. This is one of those retro style racers. You know, not the Mode 7 Super Nintendo kind, like the NES Rad Racer kind, only not very good. There's only four racers to choose from, Sonic, Tails, Eggman, and Amy, and the amount of courses is really limited. The big issue here is that because the character portraits and map take up literally half the screen, it leaves almost no room left for the road ahead of you to be visible. So it's basically the same kind concept as screen crunch in a platformer. It's hard to react to a thing that you don't even see coming. Making the map smaller might have fixed this problem, but maybe the Game Gear couldn't handle rendering the race at almost full screen and it was actually intentional? Who knows? Either way, I feel like this should have been a Genesis title. The game isn't completely terrible, but it's not great. Sonic Triple Trouble is the fourth Sonic platformer to come to the handheld. It features Knuckles, but you can't actually play as him. You can, however, play as either Sonic or Tails with a mean case of cystic acne. This one doesn't live up to Sonic Chaos at all. It isn't terrible, but it's not great. The screen crunch is back again with this one, though the sprite work does look noticeably better. The game is overall pretty easy, save for the stupid water level, which isn't exactly super difficult, but it's pretty frustrating and annoying. Although, this is where the floating bubble mechanic from Sonic Mania came from, so that's kind of neat. This isn't as badly designed as Sonic 2, but it's not as standout as Sonic 1 or Chaos. It's just very middle of the road with some frustrating parts towards the end of the game. It took me a little over an hour to beat, but if I were you, I'd just pass this one by entirely.
So this one we actually did get, and it's very weird considering we got Sonic Drift 2, yet they didn't change the title for the US market and nobody asked any questions. All right. So if you're a Mario Kart fan, you know what Mario Kart sequels are like, and this is in the same vein. Almost double the available characters, more courses, the music is better, the sprite work is a little better, the controls feel a little tighter in my opinion, but here we are with the same screen crunch issues. I pretty much had to learn to manage by glancing at the map constantly so I knew when turns were coming up so I'd know exactly when to drift, since the arrow signs don't really give you enough notice. This is overall a nice little upgrade. It didn't completely reinvent the game, and I'm pretty sure it's running off the same engine as the first game, but it's competent enough to check out. I still think this should have been a console title, though. Only took him another 15 years! Alright, I couldn't play this hunk of crap for more than 8 minutes. I'm not kidding. The total time of the video file for my footage is 8 minutes and 56 seconds. This is another Japan exclusive title. It's called Tail Sky Patrol, and it's this sort of weird amalgamate of a side-scrolling shooter and a platformer. I don't know what you'd even call this. Touching almost anything with Tail's actual sprite makes you lose a life, and the hitboxes are so weird. Half the time I can't believe I actually made contact with anything. The first stage is a training ground, and I honestly thought I wasn't even gonna get past it. I finally did though, but that's all she wrote. I couldn't beat the second, well, actually the first stage. I, I don't even think I got halfway through. Tails has this weird mechanic with this ring that he can throw or use to pick up items. I really can't figure out how to work this game. I kept dying to a door. Eventually I had enough and I just kind of watched the continue screen count me down to a game over and then smiled about it. Here's another game that's just about Tails, but this one we actually got in the US, and despite it being a platformer of sorts, it's not a platformer akin to the other games in the Sonic series. This one is more of an exploratory puzzle platformer. I also can't figure out what it's actually called because the title screen says Tails Adventures, but the box and the cartridge say Tails Adventure. Okay. So you obtain items to add to your arsenal that get you past certain roadblocks, and you need to use critical thinking to figure out how to effectively use the new items you get as you get them. It's pretty interesting as a concept, but it's not something I'd really call a great game. The gameplay is pretty slow, and it's easy to get attacked by enemies since there's no great platforming mechanics here. It kind of feels like they made enemies for a traditional platformer and then threw them into a slow-paced exploratory game. I didn't get very far because I got bored with it, but I think it's an adequate enough game. If nothing else, it's an interesting change of pace. Sonic Labyrinth is a weird, isometric game in the same vein as something like Sonic 3D Blast. Much like Sonic 3D Blast, it's about traversing pretty small isometric stages to collect a certain amount of items to progress to the next stage. In this game's case, you have to collect three keys that can be found either just lying around somewhere or being held by enemies that you need to defeat to progress. Controlling Sonic isn't fun. He walks at a snail's pace and can't run at all, so the only way to effectively get around is to spin dash everywhere, which conveniently isn't at all easy to control. I've heard a lot of people make fun of this game over the years, and it's been the butt of many jokes I've heard in the past, but now playing it for myself, I can't say this is the worst thing I've ever played. It's definitely one of the better Sonic titles on the Game Gear at least. Then again, I'm one of those weird people that like Sonic 3D Blast. I didn't finish this one, but I got pretty close. This was okay. It would be 10,000 times better though if Sonic could at least, I don't know, jog. Okay. This is the first official Sonic game that I can say with absolute full confidence looks like a straight up bootleg. You know the kind. The ones that are always called something ridiculous like Super Sonic World Adventure Land 7. Well, you can finally play as Knuckles, if that means anything to you. Unfortunately, the only platformer for the Game Gear that you can play as Knuckles in is straight up garbage. Everything was for some reason given a pre-rendered aesthetic like in Donkey Kong Country, but it all looks, well, Look, your character sprite takes up half the stupid screen, there's almost zero sprite animations, there's pretty much no background elements, coconuts is all cracked out on crack, and most of the stage assets are just completely unpolished. I don't know what this was supposed to be, but it controls bad, the level design is bad and extremely cheap in a lot of places, and the art design, if you can even call it that, had an unapologetically laughable amount of effort put into it. I don't know how anyone can look at this for even two seconds and say confidently that anybody genuinely tried here. And this is also the last last first party Game Gear title to release in North America. What a way to go out. I wish I could say Sonic had a good run on the Game Gear like many feel he had on the Genesis, but unfortunately, it just isn't the case. There's a few gems in here for sure, but the bulk of it is, well, a flaming pile of poop. And it can't be chalked up to a limitation of the hardware, because Sonic Chaos and Sonic 1 show us that the Game Gear was clearly capable of housing a decent Sonic game. Oh well, at least go play those two.
When Sonic was handed an eviction notice and had to jump ship after the demise of the Dreamcast, he had to seek refuge in another company's console. And what better place to go than your immediate competitor that aided in your own downfall? If you can't beat him, join him. A couple Sonic games were re-released as deluxe ports for Nintendo's current gen console at the time, the GameCube, but it wasn't until Sega looked at Nintendo's handheld line that they started making brand new games. A number of Sonic games were then subsequently released for the Game Boy Advance, a lot of them receiving very high praise, and others... not that. So today, let's take a look at every Sonic the Hedgehog game available on the Game Boy Advance. And I do mean game, I don't mean those cartridges that have episodes of Sonic X on them. When the first Sonic Advance came out, it would be an understatement to say I was taken aback. First off, the idea of a Sonic game being on a Game Boy seemed like blasphemy to me, and coupled with the fact that I didn't even think we'd ever get another 2D Sonic game again, I really didn't see this one coming. The first original Sonic game to be developed for another company's console, Sonic Advance aimed to go back to Sonic's Genesis roots in terms of gameplay while updating the art style to be more in line with the Sonic Adventure era of Sonic. Included as playable characters are Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and now Amy. All of them control the same as they did in their classic games, now with the addition of a melee move that I honestly never found any legitimate use for. Amy, however, needs to use melee moves to attack enemies and can't spin at all, so she's kind of hard mode in that regard, except for against bosses. As a kid, I never actually had the game myself and was envious of anyone else who owned it. Sure, I've played a couple stages here and there, but I never actually sat down to play through the whole game until now. I've always heard this was one of the good ones, so I was pretty excited to actually play through the entirety of the game for the first time. And you know what? For the most part, it really does hold up to games like Sonic 2 or 3. I don't think the pixel art has aged quite as well as the Genesis games, but level design is pretty fast-paced and fun and really reminded me a lot of the classic games that came before it. I honestly really liked it right up until Egg Rocket Zone. I was already getting a bit annoyed when I got to Angel Island Zone, but I didn't start wanting to rage quit until Egg Rocket. I went from playing a fast-paced platformer to slowly tiptoeing my way through stages apprehensively, afraid to move forward too fast for fear of bad enemy placement, surprise spikes, or completely unnecessary bottomless pits. Never before have I seen a game do a nosedive in quality so quickly and so sharply as Sonic Advance. Sure, Sonic 2 has Metropolis Zone, but at least that game ends up picking up a bit after that. This game just gives you steady quality and then a total nosedive and then the game is over. I really thought this was going to be a game I end up revisiting every now and then, but now, not so much. Sonic Advance 2 made me upset. It debatably starts off even stronger than the first game, with blinding speed and flow akin to something like Sonic 2. It really starts off with its best foot forward and grabs the player with satisfying movement and level design, at the expense of intricate platforming of course, but this really does start off feeling so much better than the first game. And then it falls apart roughly halfway through. Frustratingly cheap bosses, terrible enemy placement, and obstacles thrown in your way seemingly for the sole sake of stopping you in your tracks when you try to actually go as fast as the game encourages you to go. There's a cornucopia of bottomless pits, even more so than the first game, which I see as a fun new addition to Sonic's 2D gameplay that's here to stay, and is the entire reason I stopped playing Sonic Rush and never picked it up again. While I was playing, I told Some Call Me Johnny how frustrated I was with it, and he had this to say. New to this game is Cream the Rabbit, and unlike Amy, she can actually curl into a ball and use the spin dash, so coupled with her chow, cheese, which she can use to viciously attack enemies, you'll probably have a bit better of a time with this game if you play as her than I did with Sonic. The occasional confusing level layouts that ended up with me in bottomless pits I honestly could forgive, but the bosses just killed this game for me entirely. The first few Eggman fights were kind of fun, and I really didn't mind them, but as the game went on, the Eggman fights got more and more cheap and seemed more and more out of my control, to the point where I completely stopped having any fun whatsoever. To top it all off, the final boss, well, if you don't collect all the emeralds, that is, is a boss rush of every single Eggman fight, followed by a fight with a typical endgame giant Eggman robot. And you have to fight all these bosses back to back without getting a game over. No thanks. I was actually pretty hopeful for this one when I first booted it up. I know it's a lot of people's favorite Sonic Advance game, but I honestly can't believe how high this game lifted my expectations up just to drop them into a bottomless pit. Sonic Pinball Party, if the name didn't give it away, is a Sonic-themed pinball game that came out the year after Sonic Advance 2. Naturally, it's Sonic Adventure-themed Sonic, with some of the bells and whistles you might expect from other Sonic games coming out at the time. And by that, I mean there's mini games and a chow garden that's basically stripped right from Sonic Advance. Now, when you first boot the game up, the first option in the menu is Arcade Mode, which you can probably assume is just free play on the various pinball tables, and it is. The real meat of this game, if you can even call it that, is Story Mode, where in a shocking turn of events, Eggman turns a bunch of animals 
animals into robots and you have to save them. Between each stage, Sonic has a quick dialogue with whatever character you're about to face off with, giving a little bit of extremely shallow story exposition. Now I say face off because the story mode isn't anything more than a tournament mode against the other characters with story jammed in between. I got a few stages in, but like I said in a previous video, I suck at pinball, so I couldn't get all that far. The first few stages only require a certain amount of points to win, but by a couple stages in, there's certain table-based requirements or objectives you have to do to beat the tables. I must have achieved something though, because upon getting a game over, I unlocked a Samba de Amigo table for arcade mode. Anyway, the physics are okay. They're pretty much exactly what you'd expect from this type of game. The two single player mini games available are casino themed and there's slots and roulette. They are both shockingly unfun. The Chow Garden, which I was surprised was included at all, is pretty much the exact same thing as the one I neglected to mention was in Sonic Advance. I think it was in the second one too. It's basically just a place to raise your chow and play a couple mini games. The only thing I wasn't able to check out was party mode. I'm gonna take a wild guess and say I need a Link Cable and another Game Boy Advance because there's three mini games here, two of which say versus and one that says co-op. And uh, I don't have any of that, so I can't play them. This game isn't terribly bad, but it's pretty lacking in content and is just a very middle of the road time waster. But hey, if you wanna find a friend who has Sonic Pinball Party and a Link Cable and see what all those multiplayer mini games are about, by all means. At some point between Sonic Advance 2 and 3, someone decided it would be a good idea to make an arena fighting game in the same universe and even tie the story in with a future sequel. I didn't play long enough to find out how, but I do know that the plot of this game does tie into Sonic Advance 3. So this game isn't like totally horrendous, but despite it having some pretty advanced meta and different techniques and skills at your disposal, really that's all unnecessary and the game can pretty much just be cheesed through by button mashing. They tried to pull off that whole Game Boy Advance 3 3D thing, and I guess for all intents and purposes, it worked relatively okay. I don't have too many issues with depth perception, and besides the fact that all the constantly warping textures makes me want to vomit, I think it worked out okay for what it is. The main course of this game is its story mode, and like Sonic Adventure, picking each respective character plays out a different narrative. I only played through Sonic's campaign though, so I really can't attest to how well the stories are written. All I know is Sonic Story is the same campy Sonic story you'd expect at this point. I think the campaigns must be really short though because I finished Sonics in like an hour. You basically just walk around an earthbound looking overworld, walking back and forth to different locations, trigger dialogue with a character for story exposition, and then battle said character, rinse and repeat. Besides the typical fighting modes you'd expect of any game like this, there is a selection of mini games. Unfortunately though, once again, you can't play any of them because they're all multiplayer only. Well, all of them except one. The only one that can be played single player is Knuckles Minehunt, which is quite literally just Minesweeper with a Knuckles skin. This game is fine. I could probably see myself liking this game quite a bit if I had played it when I was a kid. I guess it's worth checking out if you never have, but just don't go into it expecting to find a hidden gem. I went into Sonic Advance 3 very worried that I'd be slogging my way through a grueling gauntlet of bad level design. I had heard from multiple sources that this one was the worst of the Advance trilogy, but in my experience, this was the only game of the three that didn't take a nosedive during its second act. Say what you will, but Sonic Advance 3 shows its colors right from the beginning and whether or not it's something you personally like is up to you, but all I know is this game didn't trick me into a false sense of security like the first two games did. So what we have here is something sort of similar to Sonic Advance 2 with more of the platforming from Sonic Advance 1. While there are still tons of bottomless pits, they didn't bother me nearly as much and the random roadblocks that bring Sonic speed to a sobering halt aren't anywhere close to the other Advance games. The boss fights are also much more fair when compared to Advance 2 and everything is just a lot more manageable with a more organic feeling difficulty curve. New to this game is a partner system I admittedly barely used. When you first start out, you can only choose Sonic and Tails and despite unlocking the other characters along the way, I never bothered to back out to the menu and swap, with the exception of uh, right here when I needed to get footage. The different characters have different abilities that can aid in platforming or combat, but none of it's actually necessary. So I stuck with the tried and true duo. This was the only game out of the three that I finished because I felt like I actually wanted to and not just because I felt required to for the video. Plus I needed to see if this game had a huge drop in quality like the others did. The stages are mostly pretty fast paced like the second game, but still feel like I'm doing something as opposed to feeling like I'm on rails. Sonic Advance 1 and 2 admittedly did have higher highs, but they both also had much much lower lows, and while I don't really think I'm ever going to revisit any of them, if I had to pick one, if only for the actually fair boss fights alone, Sonic Advance 3 is easily the most bearable, at least for me. 
Sega saved the best for last with this one, with a game that I've heard be compared in quality to that of Sonic 06, and probably not so coincidentally, this was also released in 2006. Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis is a port of the original Sonic the Hedgehog game to the Game Boy Advance. Now this game has been criticized up and down just as Sonic 06 has, but having never played it myself, I thought it must be really bad, but at least some of the criticism has to be hyperbole, right? They couldn't really have put out an official port that feels like a bootleg, could they? Yup, that's... That's exactly what Sega did. Now, I'll admit, I already am a little biased because I genuinely do not think Sonic 1 is a good game in the first place. I do respect it for what it did, but as a game, it's not great. So added to this port is something called Anniversary Mode, which just implements the spin dash into Sonic 1, and that's how I decided to play it. Even with the spin dash, the game was completely unbearable, so I shudder to think of what my experience would have been like without it. Now, like many other GBA ports of console titles, this game suffers really badly from screen crunch and it's near impossible to see upcoming obstacles and react to them. While this is bad, it's not the first game to suffer from this, so I can't be too mad about it. It is a problem, but it's not a problem exclusive to this game, necessarily. The main event here is the fact that the game just borderline does not work. They ported Sonic 1 over by rebuilding it on a completely different engine, and honestly, it feels less like the engine was designed for the Game Boy Advance, and more like it was uh, made for a Texas Instruments graphing calculator. The physics just make absolutely no sense. The whole game runs like it's in slow motion, and yet on top of that, momentum speeds up and then slows down intermittently. It quite literally feels uncontrollable. The game must be running at full speed, though, because the music stays at a constant tempo regardless of what's going on in-game. On top of all that, hitboxes are all off, and everything just feels super wonky, to the point where even if the game was running at full speed, it still wouldn't feel right. I played all the way up until, you, you guessed it, Labyrinth Zone got through Act 1, at which point I just couldn't do it anymore. The game already feels like you're playing with underwater physics as it is, so to compound that with an actual water level and one of the worst and most frustrating levels in the game, no thank you. I don't know how Sega decided to end its GBA run on this, but this is among the worst, most unplayable trash I've ever seen officially released. What a swan song. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go play Sonic Mania or something to cleanse my palate. The movie's coming out in like a week, so I gotta be ready! So, in a couple previous videos, I covered the Sonic games that came out for the Game Gear as well as the Game Boy Advance, and now it's the Nintendo DS's turn. These games all but flew past my radar when they first came out, so I don't have much experience with them, but now I'm gonna take a look at the handful of Sonic games that came out for the DS. Today, let's check out what Sega brought to the table when representing their mascot on Nintendo's successor to the Game Boy line. All right, so I'm gonna go in order of release, and I'm only gonna cover strictly Sonic the Hedgehog games. No Sega Party games or crossovers, so you're not gonna see Sonic playing tennis or doing gymnastics today. With that out of the way, let's get into it. The first Sonic game to be released on the DS is Sonic Rush, a game which absolutely lives up to its name. It features Blaze the Cat as a playable character in her first appearance, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Sonic Rush is a fast-paced, frantic 2D Sonic game that for the most part is actually pretty good, but it falls short in a few frustrating ways. The main gimmick of the game is the implementation of the tension gauge, which fills up when you defeat enemies or do mid-air tricks. When filled, it allows you to use the boost, which instantly ramps up your speed, allowing you to reach higher ledges and also lets you plow past and knock out enemies like a speeding truck. The game's plot is explained through text dialogue cutscenes, so there is some story explanation here unlike most of Sonic's classic 2D outings. I'll save all the intricate details, but just know the game involves the clashing of dimensions, which is why Blaze is not only here, but the game's new antagonist, Eggman Nega, the Eggman from Blaze's dimension. Now, the level design here is for the most part pretty solid. It has fast-paced rails and loops, harkening back to classic stages like Chemical Plant Zone or Hydro City Zone, and coupled with the boost, the gameplay is overall pretty kinetic except for, you know, when it isn't. See, Dimps, the team behind the Advanced series, is responsible for this one, and if you've played those, you'll know they, for some reason, have a weird obsession with bottomless pits, and they seem to completely take the gloves off for this one. On top of the excessive bottomless pits, there's also random bouts of awkward platforming that's not only really uncomfortable and sketchy to do, but it also completely breaks up the pace of the game. One second, you're blasting through a stage at the speed of sound, and the next thing you know, you're juggling between the jump button and D-pad trying to awkwardly hop across a series of platforms 
which more often than not are hovering above a bottomless pit. Luckily though, playing as Blaze mitigates this quite a bit. She's a bit slower than Sonic, but she also has a hover ability that can be used by pressing the right shoulder button. I didn't find this out until I played a ton of the game as Sonic, but I would say that playing as Blaze definitely makes the game a bit more bearable, as her hover ability makes the platforming a good deal more forgiving. Also, the boss fights in the game are actually pretty fun and about a hundred times better than anything seen in the Advanced Trilogy. Unlike the rest of the game, which utilizes both screens on the DS for gameplay, the boss fights are relegated to the top screen, using the bottom screen for the boss's health bar. The bosses give a decent challenge without being too difficult or frustrating, though they can drag on a bit too long sometimes since the bosses take so many hits and you can only attack once per cycle. It's not that obnoxious on the first fight, but if you for whatever reason happen to die, having to restart the fight from the beginning can prove to be pretty annoying. Overall, Sonic Rush is pretty good, but it definitely suffers from some classic Dimps game design. So two years later, a follow-up to Sonic Rush was released entitled Sonic Rush Adventure. This is honestly a weird one. The gameplay itself is essentially identical to the first game. The soundtrack I think is a little bit better, and I even think the level design overall is a bit more polished. When you actually get to see it, that is. If you couldn't tell by the title, Sonic Rush Adventure took a slightly different approach than its predecessor and put way more of an emphasis on that adventure part. Out of the multiple hours that I played this game, only about a third or less of that was actually spent tearing up 2D Sonic levels. The game is super super padded out with not only really, really long text box cutscenes, but also with glorified minigames that gate your progression to each new zone. Basically, the game's different zones are split up between different islands that you need to sail to, but you need to use one of four different vehicles to access them. When piloting one of these vehicles, you have to play through a pretty boring minigame to sail to whatever destination you're headed towards. It's nothing difficult, but it's not exactly engaging, and it pretty much just serves as a time waster. As I said, there are four vehicles in the game. You need to have Tails build them before you're able to use them. To build them, you need materials that you get as a reward for completing the different stages depending on the score you get when you clear them, and unless you get an S rank, you'll inevitably end up needing to replay stages you've already completed multiple times just to get the arbitrary items that the game requires you to have to play the next stage. This exists for the sole purpose of padding out the length of the game. They put grinding in a Sonic game, and not the good type of grinding. At the very least though, the bosses are a lot better. Gone is the issue with being able to only hit a boss once per cycle, and now you can just wail on them like a traditional 2D Sonic game. And this drastically cuts down the amount of time it takes to beat each boss, making them way, way more fun and more bearable. Sonic Rush Adventure bothers me. If it wasn't for all the extra padding they put into the game, I think I'd say it's actually a good step up from the first game. When I actually got to play 2D Sonic stages, I found myself enjoying these more, but the amount of time it takes to be able to do that isn't exactly worth it in my opinion. I don't think the game is necessarily bad at all, and maybe the extra stuff they threw in appeals to some people, but I can't say I'm one of them. Also, Blaze is here again. A year later, in 2008, Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood came out. If you didn't already know this game existed, the idea of Bioware making a Sonic the Hedgehog RPG probably sounds insane, but like, insane enough to maybe actually be good, right? Well, it didn't pan out that way, and Sega effectively put the Blue Blur's name on something that if you told me was a Flash game, I'd probably believe you. Now, normally, I try to invest at least a good chunk of time into the games that I cover on videos like these, but I couldn't bring myself to play this one for more more than 30 minutes. I realize this is a cop-out, but I feel no shame here. Now I will say, the uh, totally real Nintendo DS I was playing on was for some reason not rendering the game right, making certain assets for some reason not appear beyond the top half of the bottom screen, which is why my footage looks messed up, but honestly, even if the game was running flawlessly, I don't think that would do much to make this any more bearable. Also doesn't help that you can't use the D-pad to traverse the overworld for some reason, and the game requires you to move around with a stylus, or in my case, a mouse. Now, if you've ever heard anything about this game at all, there's probably a good chance you've heard how bad the soundtrack and overall sound design is. Apart from the track that's currently playing in the background right now, I'll spare you the distress, but just know that all the music is awkwardly dissonant and hard on the ears, and most if not all the sound effects sound like they were downloaded straight from a stock library of cartoon sounds like a Hanna-Barbera bumper. From what I've played, the battles are pretty terrible. I obviously didn't play far enough in to really get a full grasp on the battle system, but then again, the game didn't do anything to make it remotely fun to begin with. Also, during some random encounters, for some reason, the game makes you play this little endless runner type minigame before you can even start the battle, and it also likes to randomly throw it in during the middle of a fight too, breaking up the pace of an already mindless affair. Trust me, I'd love to have more to say about this one, but I think even if my life depended on it, I'd still be a bit reluctant to sink time into this. It'd be one thing if 
if I was doing a whole video dedicated to Sonic Chronicles, but I think for this video, I more than got the gist of what this game's bringing to the table. No thanks. As they often have been known to do for about a million different platforms, Sega released a collection of Sonic games for the DS called Sonic Classic Collection. It's a super bare-bones compilation of Sonic 1 through 3, as well as Sonic and & Knuckles in both Knuckles & Sonic 2 and 3. When I say bare bones, I mean there isn't even like a startup screen or anything. The game boots up and you're at the title screen. There's no fancy menu animations, all the games are just emulated, and the only extras to speak of are an image gallery and an option to view the credits. Personally, I remember actually enjoying this one a bit when I was younger, but going back to it, it's honestly pretty shoddy. I think I was probably just satisfied with having the classic Sonic games all fully playable on my DS, but playing it now, not only is the game a bit squished due to the DS's screen, causing not only a distorted aspect ratio but some glitchy looking assets, but there's also a good deal of input lag as well, and the sound emulation is especially bad and difficult to listen to. This collection is at best serviceable, but considering Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis came out on the GBA, this is admittedly quite a step up from that. Beggars can't be choosers, I guess. So Sonic Colors just so happens to be my favorite and probably the most well-polished game out of the ones I'm covering today. But despite that, I don't have all that much to say about it, and that's basically because it's entirely derivative of the Sonic Rush games. It's for all intents and purposes Sonic Rush 3, only with added gimmicks pulled from Sonic Colors and the lack of Blaze as a playable character. This has not only the best level design out of all the Rush-style games, but it also trims away almost 100% of the fat. There are a lot of text-filled cutscenes, but if you really want, you can just avoid them all entirely by just pressing the start button. Doing that gives you a straight-up 2D Sonic game with no filler, no silly minigames besides the obligatory special stages, and no grinding or silly objectives that gate your progression. The only thing standing between you and progress in the game is finishing stages and beating bosses. I can't say I'm a huge fan of the Wisps, but while I don't love them, I don't really think they take too much away from the pace of the game, and I think their inclusion is fine. Sonic also has a bit better of a moveset as well. They got rid of the trick system, and in its place are more modern Sonic mechanics like the homing attack. There are some extra challenges you can complete alongside the main stages, but I didn't really care enough to play them. They're pretty much just new challenges set in stages you've already completed. Don't let the name fool you. Sonic Colors is wholeheartedly a part of the Sonic Rush series, and it just so happens to be what I think is the best one at that. And that about wraps it up. I think despite Sonic Rush Adventure being a little bit of a low point, all three of those games were actually pretty enjoyable, high-quality games, and I think they stand out more than the advanced games of the previous generation. Not so much for their style, but I think the Rush series games kept a more consistent level of quality than the advanced series did. Aside from that little blemish of Sonic Chronicles, I think Sega managed to maintain a pretty high bar of quality when representing Sonic on the DS. Good on them. Initially, when I made my Game Gear Sonic video, I didn't have any intention of making a series out of it. Since then, though, I ended up covering the Sonic games on GBA as well as the DS, so it only made sense that I'd eventually need to do a video on the 3DS games. Problem is, I really couldn't cover them properly without being able to capture gameplay footage. For a while now, I've been trying to come up with ways I could pull this off, but as it turns out, I somehow got very lucky and was able to acquire a 3DS with a capture card installed, so now I can finally do it. Today's the day. Let's check out the Sonic games available for the 3DS. All right, so as usual, I'm gonna go in order of release. Normally, I'd only be covering main entries and no spin-offs, like racing games or party games, for example, but the 3DS is a rare case where a couple of spin-off games are actually much closer to main releases in terms of scope. Then again, I did cover Tails Adventure and Tails Sky Patrol, but those still exist in the same universe as Classic Sonic. I'm sure most of you already know which games I'm talking about, so that's what we're gonna do today. I do, however, want to quickly mention the 3D ports of Sonic 1 and 2. I feel like this video wouldn't be complete without at least acknowledging them, but I don't think enough changes were made to warrant their own segments. Basically, Sonic 1 and 2 were ported to the 3DS, were given a 3D effect, and feature a few quality of life improvements such as the spin dash in Sonic 1 and a level select for both. Apparently these are pretty good ports, but at the end of the day, they're Sonic 1 and 2 on the 3DS. If you like Sonic 1 and 2, and you want to play them on the go, you can do a lot worse than these ports. The first Sonic game to hit the 3DS was Sonic Generations all the way back in 2011. Despite sharing the same name as its console counterpart, Sonic Generations for the 3DS isn't a port, but rather an original handheld take on the game built from the ground up, and then with the exception of Green Hill, features completely different zones exclusive to the 3DS version, and to be honest, I think I like the zone choices for Generations 3DS a bit more than the console version. The game is set up very similarly to the console version, with Act 1 of stages being classic Sonic's job and Act 2 being played with modern Sonic. 
Sonic, but the actual gameplay itself has been changed quite a bit. I guess they couldn't really pull off modern Sonic gameplay on the 3DS, so now, instead of the typical classic and modern that you're probably used to, modern Sonic plays much more in line with how he did in the Rush series. This unfortunately does make playing as classic Sonic seem a bit less enjoyable, but he does gain access to the homing attack later on, which does spice up his sections a bit more. This is probably a pretty polarizing change, but I think it was a good inclusion in practice. After you complete both acts of each stage, you're given access to a special stage where you can collect one of the emeralds. I actually really like these stages. They're pretty similar to Sonic 2's special stages, but a lot more fair. And honestly, maybe just a little too easy, but I still had a good time with them. The bosses in the 3DS version are also totally different, and each boss, save for the final one, are actually a two-part ordeal, with the first encounter being a race against another character, and the second being a real fight against various different bosses from the series, like Big Arm from Sonic 3 or the Bio Lizard from SA2. Now those boss races kinda suck. Maybe some people have fun with these, but to me, they were just annoying. They're not that hard, but there really isn't anything engaging about them, at least to me, and even when it comes to the story, it seems unnecessary, and I'm really not sure why I'm racing against Shadow and Metal. The actual bosses aren't very hard either, but I do think they're a pretty fun time, even if I do just end up defaulting to abusing the ring system instead of playing well. I think all the bosses are pretty solid except for the final boss, which I never actually beat until now. Years ago, when I played this game, I got up to the time eater, and no matter what I did, I kept running out of rings and losing. It's a long boss fight too, so eventually I just put the game down and gave up, and I almost never do that with a game that I enjoy. Out of all the games I'm going to talk about today, this was actually the only one I played prior to recording footage for this video. I got the game years ago because I played Sonic Generations and loved it, and I thought it was just Sonic Generations on the go. Turns out, it had a bunch of stages in it that I wished had been in the console version like Casino Night, Mushroom Hill, or Radical Highway. I actually like almost every single zone in this game, except for water pallets from Sonic Rush. I could go the rest of my life never playing that zone ever again, and I'd be a happier person for it. Back to back, turn around the back. All in all, I know some people are divided about it, but I think Sonic Generations for the 3DS is a really solid game. Not only is it a great companion to the console game, but I think it's good enough to stand on its own two feet as an original game regardless of if you've played the other version. A couple years later, Sonic Lost World came out, and this one, while not being an actual port, falls more in line with the Wii U version. Tweaks were made to the controls and level design, but unlike the usual 2D adaptation of a console game, Lost World 3DS looks and plays very similarly to its Wii U counterpart. Now I've seen countless people tell me that Lost World 3DS is bad, but I've got to be honest here, I, I didn't hate it. As the game progresses, it definitely gets a bit more janky and seems to ramp up in difficulty, and, and not the good kind of difficulty, but I I think this game is actually pretty decent, all things considered. Not good, but definitely serviceable. Sonic does feel kind of floaty, so more often than not, precise platforming is a bit anxiety-inducing, but when this game is doing what it does best, which is the typical cylindrical Lost World adaptation of Sonic's gameplay, dare I say it can be decently fun. As far as the story goes, if you know the Lost World story, that's what you're getting here. Only this time it's presented in cutscenes that I don't think could be more compressed if they tried. You might think these just look bad because it's all blown up to 1080p, but no, they looked bad on the 3DS as well. They just happen to look even worse when blown up. Anyway, the story is what it is, and I don't think I've ever met a person in my life who cared at all about the Deadly Six. Sega wants Zavok to be a thing, so bad, and he's just never gonna be a thing. There's seven worlds, each consisting of three zones, a boss, and a special stage. Stages vary quite a bit here. There's the gameplay style I mentioned before, pretty much just an adaptation of typical Sonic gameplay. There's 2D stages, which aren't too bad. They're not as good as an actual 2D Sonic game, but I think they do the job just fine and they're relatively inoffensive. The game also starts incorporating some non-linear stages with puzzle elements, and those were alright too. At times it definitely seemed like padding a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. The bosses, like pretty much any Sonic bosses, are easily cheesed via the ring system. I will say though, the fights themselves are kind of interesting since there's more strategy involved than just bopping them on the head. You need to figure out how to beat each of the deadly six and then exploit their weaknesses. As for the actual bosses as characters, I never liked them. They look like the Monstars from Space Jam, and each of them have a completely one-dimensional personality, such as Wise and Fat. Now there is one gameplay type that I need to talk about because I'm honestly shocked at how bad it is. See. The special stages are these free roaming flying levels where you have to collect a certain amount of orbs in a time limit. Typical stuff, right? The problem is, 
you don't use the circle pad and instead the controls are mapped to the gyroscope. Normally I like gyro controls and almost never have an issue with them, but boy, whoever programmed these screwed them up real bad. These stages had me swinging my 3DS all around the room, twisting my arms in ungodly positions and praying that Sonic would go in the direction I wanted him to. And for whatever reason, you can only turn so far. So if you move your 3DS too far in one direction, the calibration gets all messed up and you'll need to fix it, which is a problem considering you're on a time limit. It's hard to describe just how bad it is, but just spend like 30 seconds with these special stages and you'll probably get exactly what I mean. And I know someone in the comments is just going to tell me I suck, but I don't care. This is trash. <clears throat> anyway, the game seems to run pretty well, considering they didn't make all that many sacrifices when making the handheld version. The only hiccups I really encountered was when I had like a ton of rings and got hit. That resulted in some slowdown. I feel like that's something that should have been fixed considering how often that can happen, but other than that, the game seemed to run fine. Honestly, despite hearing so many people say they hated this game and then dreading it, I ended up not hating it. Don't get me wrong, there's definitely some cheap garbage in here and there is absolutely a good deal of padding here and there as well, but I think all things considered, Lost World 3DS isn't so terrible. It is absolutely no masterpiece, but you can do a whole lot worse than this and it's not at all something I'd consider a bad game, except for those special stages. Those are bad. So next up is Sonic Boom Shattered Potential, I mean Crystal. This has honestly been a long time coming. Veterans of the channel will remember I actually reviewed Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric back when it came out, and it was one of the first handful of videos I ever did. By now, everybody knows that game is hot trash, but I always heard the 3DS Sonic Boom game that came out alongside it was much better. Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal really doesn't have all that much in common with the game that came out for the Wii U. Instead of a platforming slash beat em up adventure game, it's far more in line with what we're typically used to when it comes to handheld Sonic games. It's a more traditional side-scrolling 2D Sonic game that actually controls pretty well and feels good to play. It's a bit different than most people are probably used to since in the Boom universe, Sonic isn't exactly the same speedy character he is in the rest of the series. He's still technically the fast one, but it's definitely not the same. The boost from games like Sonic Rush also isn't present here, and the game relies far more on using the homing attack to dispose of enemies. Another main platforming mechanic is the Ener Beam, which sees far more usage in this game than in Rise of Lyric. It's basically a grappling hook that you need to use to swing off of certain obstacles. As you progress in the game, you gain access to other characters whose different abilities need to be used depending on the situation that presents itself. This aspect doesn't really make the gameplay any deeper, and needing to switch characters every once in a while for an arbitrary obstacle that only one of the characters can get through seems to mainly exist to give us the illusion of variety. As for the story, there are some cutscenes, but most of the dialogue is presented through text boxes and static images. Normally, I'd just breeze through stuff like this, but I will give credit where credit is due and acknowledge the fact that the writing is actually pretty funny sometimes, which isn't all that surprising considering the Sonic Boom TV show was written well. Come to think of it, it actually is a bit surprising because as I remember, the dialogue in Rise of Lyric totally sucked and was like an off-brand corny version of what the show would later deliver, but I digress. Now, for those of you who haven't played this game, you might be wondering why I called the game Sonic Boom Shattered Potential. And for those of you who have played it, you're probably waiting for the part where I tell you the game is terrible. Well, here it comes. Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal had the potential to be a pretty decent and fun game, maybe not the best Sonic offering on 3DS, but commendable and decent. But unfortunately, despite the good controls and mechanics, the entire experience is completely bogged down by one thing. This is not a linear Sonic game. It is, for all intents and purposes, a Metroidvania, and not a very good one at that. See, in the overworld map, stages must be unlocked before you can play them. Normally, this would just require completing a certain amount of prior stages, but Shattered Crystal has numerous objectives within each stage, which earns you these gold medals that you need to unlock stages. You get one for completing a stage, sure, but it only takes about four stages before you're forced to return to old ones to get more medals. This consists of going back and scouring the map, yes, I said map, because when I said this is akin to a Metroidvania, I meant it, and collecting a certain number of hidden collectibles. This often requires a lot of backtracking and the level design isn't exactly conducive to that. Instead of one wide open map, you take these launch pads to different chunks of it. 
This becomes very annoying and tedious very quickly, because often you may go too far and get blocked off from backtracking, and then you'll need to proceed further in the stage just to send yourself back for something you missed. And it really doesn't help at all that these stages are long, and I mean like 10, 15, or even 20 minutes long, filled to the brim with padding. Sometimes these collectibles are also locked behind really boring and tedious minigames too, which doesn't make the situation any better. In my opinion at least, this game is not very fun at all, it's repetitive and wastes a ton of your time. Actually, before I started playing it, I googled how long it took to beat, and it said 8 hours. Before playing, I didn't understand how it could possibly take 8 hours, but it took about 30 minutes of playtime for me to figure out how padding. This game could have actually been pretty fun, but unfortunately they blew it with this one. To be honest though, having played through Rise of Lyric, it's no surprise to me that Shattered Crystal was considered the good one. At least this game functions. In an unexpected turn of events, Sanzaru Games, the developer of Shattered Crystal, must have heard all the criticisms people had because a couple years later, they released a sequel that fixed nearly every single issue I and a lot of other people had with the first game. Sonic Boom Fire and Ice is a direct follow-up to Shattered Crystal, and to make sure this game was as good as it could possibly be, it was even delayed to make sure it was given extra polish. While it won't blow your mind or anything, this is everything Shattered Crystal should have been. Gone is the progression gating through collectibles. Instead, every single collectible in the game can be completely ignored if you want to. The stages themselves are also much, much shorter, only a few minutes apiece, and only a few more minutes if you decide to go for the collectibles. Not only are there way less collectibles, but you also don't need to take a huge detour just to grab one. The most the game will really ask of you is to deviate a screen or two and then it's back to the main path. The environments this time around are way more interesting as well. Nothing to write home about, but definitely more visually captivating than Shadow crystal. Even the optional minigames have been given an overhaul, like the one where you pilot Tails' submarine to grab treasure within a certain time limit. Not only does it look better visually, but you used to have to grab the treasure and then find your way out. Now all the game asks of you is to find the treasure, short and sweet. That's the biggest difference with this game. It doesn't waste your time. Now, Fire and Ice gets its name from its main mechanic this time around. For a reason that doesn't really make any sense in the story and just kinda happens, Sonic and the gang have a fire and ice power that lets them manipulate certain parts of the stage, more often than not turning water into a solid platform with the ice ability or melting it with fire. There are a couple times where this did add a good deal of depth to the level design, but unfortunately it's super under utilized for the most part, and 90% of the time, it's not actually used in a clever way, but rather an arbitrary reason to have to press the R button. That other 10% though definitely shows this mechanic could have made level design super interesting if used properly, but they kind of dropped the ball on this one. The bosses this time around are actually bosses too. All Shattered Crystal had to offer was this on-rails worm race thing. I wouldn't say these are the most intricately designed bosses of the franchise, but they do a good job of switching up the gameplay. Everything about this game moves so, so much faster than its predecessor. And the best part about it is if you want to take your time, explore, and smell the roses, you can, and you'll be rewarded for it. But if you'd rather blaze through all the stages at breakneck speed to get it all done as fast as possible, you can do that too. The game's controls have been tightened up by a pretty big margin as well. I thought Shattered Crystal controlled just fine, but this just feels so much more polished. It's hard to describe, but playing them back to back, there's no question, and it's immediately obvious. Now, I've gotta be fair, overall, I'd say this game is pretty forgettable, all things considered. I'd say it's a bit better than some of the other handheld Sonic games, but it's probably not gonna be a game you come back to very often, if at all. But I will say, it's definitely worth trying out at least. It did surprise me quite a bit. It may not be amazing, but it's a relatively good game and much, much better than the other games bearing the Sonic Boom title. If this had been the only game in the franchise, I doubt most people would have many negative things to say about it. I'd say give this one a go, even though, as Ant Dude pointed out to me, Knuckles looks like he ate bees. And that's all of them. You know, going into this, I was expecting to find mostly garbage considering how many negative opinions I've seen over the years, and while I always thought Generations was a good game, Lost World, despite not being good necessarily, ended up not being the dumpster fire I was led to believe it was, and Fire and Ice was something I would even call good. Shattered Crystal though, there's just no save in that game in my opinion, and it's telling considering literally all of its issues were addressed in the sequel. If you're a Sonic fan and you haven't played any of the games I talked about today, definitely give Generations a shot. And if you're feeling saucy, maybe even check out Fire and Ice. Don't touch Shattered Crystal though, against Poo Poo.
A good while ago now, I started a series where I looked at the Sonic games that came out for various handheld game systems. We looked at the titles available for Sega's Game Gear, the Game Boy Advance, the DS, and even the 3DS. Now, my plan was to put them all together in one big handheld Sonic games episode compilation, but there was one problem. There were more games I hadn't covered across various handheld systems, most of which were one-offs and couldn't fill an entire episode individually. So I realized the only solution was to track down the remaining ones, regardless of how obscure, regardless of the hardware I needed to buy, or hoops I needed to jump through to emulate, and finally tie up these loose ends. So today, let's talk about the remaining and often obscure Sonic games strewn across various different handheld platforms, most of which you probably don't own. Okay, so let's set a few ground rules so this doesn't get completely out of hand. As usual, I'm going to cover these games in order of release, but I'm only going to cover games for dedicated gaming hardware. That means hardware designed specifically for video games. That means no mobile games, although there's technically one exception to this rule, and if you already know what it is, I'm sure you already understand why. No old school Java games, of which there's a bunch. Maybe for another video someday, but these videos are for Sonic games on gaming handhelds. Also, no party games. These have to be games that take place solely in the universe of the Sonic franchise, so no crossovers. And lastly, this is just for games exclusive to handhelds, no ports of console games. I'm looking at you, PS Vita. I know an exception to this was made for the first episode I did on Game Gear Sonic games, since a lot of those games were also released for the Sega Master System, but that's a rare occurrence due to the fact that the Game Gear is essentially a portable Master System. <sighs> okay, so without further ado, let's take a look at these. <sighs> Unfortunately, first up on this list is probably one of the worst video games I've ever played in my entire life. It's called Sonic Jam, but despite the name, it really is nothing like its console counterpart. It was released for the infamous and short-lived Gamecom, a handheld by Tiger Electronics who are most known for the little LCD handhelds they used to produce. But whereas those were very simple toys, each based on one specific thing respectively, the Gamecom was an actual system, if you could call it that, that could play multiple different games. As you could probably imagine, this was uh, not the easiest thing to be able to play, so let me just tell you now, if you have any interest in checking this game out, and you don't intend to track down an actual physical Gamecom and a copy of the game just for collection purposes, just stop and turn back now. Getting this to run on my PC was a nightmare, and the amount of hoops I had to jump through just to get this pile of crap to boot was insane. It took me multiple hours, a ton of trial and error, three different ways of launching MAME, and a nice migraine to finally get this thing up and running. And that's because there's no standalone emulator that exists for the Gamecom. Big surprise. Apparently at one point there was one, but it came out back in like 2011, and as far as I know, it doesn't work, at least not anymore. Because of the lack of a proper dedicated emulator, you need to run it via MAME, but that's easier said than done, and by the end I was ripping my hair out. And that's before even needing to play this hunk of shit. But alas, I digress. Sonic Jam, on the surface, looks like a handheld collection of Sonic 2, 3, and Knuckles, as the main menu suggests, but this is a fallacy. Instead, it's a bastardized chimera of those three. Each quote-unquote game is actually a four-act zone, each based on the first stage of each respective game. Sonic 2 is based on Emerald Hill, Sonic 3 is based on Angel Island Zone, and Sonic and & Knuckles is based on Mushroom Hill. It has this weird structure where the first act is a normal goal clear stage, but then the subsequent three zones each have a boss all from each respective game, but paying no mind to each original game's boss order, I need to stop saying each. Now, as for how this thing plays, I can't even really begin to describe how bad this actually feels. Momentum makes absolutely no sense, the game runs at about two frames a second, like literally I'm not even exaggerating at all, hitboxes make no sense, collision is often broken, the music are all these horrible renditions of random sonic tracks and they all seem to have wrong dissonant notes all over the place within them. The amount of screen crunch here is some of the worst I've ever seen, and to top it all off, the timer runs super fast for no reason, so it's extremely easy to time out in this game, and this isn't at all helped by the fact that some of the stages are quite literally less Brinthian. Now, you have the option to play as Sonic, Tails, or Knuckles, but I'm gonna just tell you right now, there's absolutely zero reason to play as 
anyone other than Tails. Sonic has no abilities at all, Knuckles is also stripped of his gliding and climbing abilities and is basically just a sprite swap of Sonic, but for whatever reason, Tails still retains his flight ability. I want to say this breaks the game, but the game is already so unfair and infuriating to the point where it borders on unplayable that, honestly, selecting Tails just makes this game n not bearable, but at the very least possible to complete without save states. I genuinely have no idea how anyone beats this game playing as Sonic or Knuckles. Also, at one point, I stumbled upon a special stage ring, and I'm entirely convinced they're impossible to beat. And my assumption was further supported when I tried to find info about what happens when you beat the special stages, and not even Sonic Retro had information on what happens when you beat them, only that they exist in the first place. Anyway, this is one of the worst things I've ever played in my life. Wow! There was many a time when I was little that I would be walking around a Toys R Us or any other retail store that sold games and among the displays for all much more popular systems, I would see the section where Neo Geo Pocket stuff was sold. I never really had any idea what it was, especially when the Neo Geo Pocket Color came out and I was like, what is this and why is it trying to rip off the Game Boy Color? I was like, this isn't Nintendo or Sega, what is this? If only stupid eight-year-old me who played Sonic 2 religiously had any idea what this little handheld was home to. Two decades later, and I'm just now playing Sonic Pocket Adventure for the first time. Can you imagine if we had these when we were 12? Even better, we got them when we're 40. I wish I had known sooner just how good this is. Now, of course, I don't want to oversell this, so let's be realistic, because at its core, much like any of the other Sonic handheld games from back then, it's not as tight and responsive as its console counterparts. So I will add that the disclaimer of everything I'm gonna say is that this is still a handheld Sonic game from the 90s and it does feel like one. That being said, this game is so goddamn cool. One might say it is way past cool. Most of you probably know by now that my favorite video game of all time is Sonic 2. So it's no surprise that I like this game as much as I do. What Pocket Adventure basically is, is this weird amalgamation of various classic Sonic elements, but whereas the last game was a fever dream, Sonic Pocket Adventure is actually pretty good. The stages are mostly all based on Sonic 2, save for the final stage, which is sort of a mashup from what I can tell, and most of the music is taken directly from Sonic 3 and Knuckles. It doesn't always fit, especially when you enter a stage that, despite its name, looks identical to a zone from Sonic 2, only to hear a random track from Sonic 3, but it's actually really cool to hear official stripped-down renditions of Sonic 3 music. I'd specify that it's 16-bit, but so is the Genesis, so there'd be no technical distinction, but I will say it leans far more into the sound of of an 8-bit chip tune as opposed to the Genesis iconic sound. And I mean, the, the visually it looks like an 8-bit game too, so. Like I said, the stages are all mostly based on stages from Sonic 2, but with, for whatever reason, completely different zone names. And it's not even like they only base the level assets on Sonic 2's because while these stages are redesigned and not the same, they do share some memorable Sonic 2 locales that anyone who knows that game front to back will recognize. The Eggman boss fights are all different too. Some are brand new, but the bulk are loosely based on Sonic 2 Eggman fights, but with a totally different spin on all of them that changes up the fights entirely. I actually find these bosses to be more challenging than in Sonic 2, and while that is in part due to having less tight controls, it more so is just the fact that these bosses take a little more thought and attention to beat and can't really be spammed like in Sonic 2. Sonic Pocket Adventure pulls some other elements from Sonic 3 as well besides just the music. Knuckles shows up literally out of nowhere, and then you have to face off against him like in Sonic 3 before the final fight with Eggman, which itself is very reminiscent of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, save for the fact that, for whatever reason, the final fight is literally the easiest one in the game and actually can be cheesed a little. Or at least that would be the final fight, if not for the existence of the Chaos Emeralds, which can be obtained roughly the same way as in Sonic 2, using exactly the same type of special stages. But instead of having special stages be accessed via checkpoints, they went the Sonic 1 route and added giant rings at the goalposts that appear, shockingly, if you make it to the end of the stage with 50 rings. Now, this is kind of a huge glaring problem, because in Sonic 1, you had two chances to not only make the ring appear, but beat the special stage, since Sonic 1 typically has three acts per stage. 
and the special stages were easier. Sonic 2, while difficult in its special stages, gave you the option to try them a bunch of times per stage with the plentiful amount of checkpoints that you could access them from. Like in Sonic 2, if you're good enough, you can literally get Super Sonic while you're still in Emerald Hill Zone. Unfortunately, in Sonic Pocket Adventure, you only get one chance at an Emerald per stage, and they start to get pretty difficult because of what they're based on. And each zone only houses one specific Emerald, so each Emerald in the game you need to get first try on every single stage or else you can't get them all. Now, I'm not sure about going back and stage selecting afterwards, but for a straight run-through or first-time playthrough, getting all the emeralds is an extremely unforgiving task to accomplish. All that being said, spoiler, I didn't get them all, and I wasn't about to go back and bust my ass to do it. What happens is, once you collect the initial six Chaos Emeralds via the special stages, in the final Eggman fight, you need to aim for the emerald powering his machine instead of attacking him. Doing so will have Sonic collect the final emerald, and instead of the game ending there, you get a final, final boss fight, which is obviously heavily inspired by Sonic 3 & Knuckles. What all this means, though, is getting all the emeralds is extremely difficult and doesn't give you access to Super Sonic in normal play. Kinda disappointing, but still kinda cool that this final boss fight exists. Now, apparently, it is possible to play as Tails, but once again, not under normal circumstances. The game has a link feature, and apparently if you link up on real hardware and play with someone else, the player too gets to play as Tails. I think it's kind of weird that his gameplay was implemented and he has an entire sprite sheet, but it is completely absent from the game if playing alone. Like, I don't know why they went out of their way to put him in the game, but then you can't play as him unless you are under extremely specific circumstances. Anyway, after you beat the game, there's some other stuff you can do as well, including time trials and even these puzzles that you put together from pieces that you find in the base game's various stages. If you complete three of them, you unlock a sound test mode, and if you can manage to complete all six, you unlock a special stage option as well. Sonic Pocket Adventure is probably the most fun I've had with a handheld Sonic game, at least in terms of the 8 or 16-bit ones. There's a few hiccups here and there, but overall, this was pretty fun and polished, and any fan of the classic games will have a good time with this one. Some of you may have to get over the uh, green eyes, though. This next one, there really isn't too much to say about it, so I'll try just briefly going over it. Back in the early 2000s, gaming on your cell phone wasn't really a thing. Sure, most phones had simple games like Snake or something, but back then, cell phones weren't really used for gaming. They were primarily used for making phone calls. Even texting was done via the T9 method with a normal phone keypad, if you have any idea what that is or remember that. Times were tough. Well, in 2003, Nokia, famously known for making phones that were seemingly indestructible, came out with a cell phone that was a hybrid of a phone and a gaming handheld. Now, like I said in the beginning, I said I wasn't going to cover mobile games in this video, but I think this still qualifies as it was created to be both a cell phone and a dedicated gaming handheld. One of the N-Gage's launch titles was called Sonic N. And the reason I mentioned that there wasn't much to say about it is because it's literally just a port of Sonic Advance 1. I guess since Sonic Advance was named after the Game Boy Advance, they decided to change the name to reflect the end gauge, despite the fact that the game is, for the most part, the same. The only areas where the game differs from the GBA release is that they just kind of made it worse. It's Sonic Advance with a much more narrow viewing window due to the end gauge's screen being oriented in portrait, omission of the tiny Chow Garden, and some tracks in the sound test are also absent. Not to mention, it also runs slower than the GBA version. The game can be played in a letterboxed 4-3 aspect ratio, but at the expense of reduced graphical fidelity and a much smaller screen, which can't even be toggled until you enter a stage. There really is no winning here. It's cool that the N-Gage got a port of Sonic Advance, especially if this was your only means of playing it, but saying this port isn't the ideal way to play Sonic Advance would be an extreme understatement. Though to be fair, I'd really love to meet the people who passed up the Game Boy Advance in 2001, only to buy the Game Taco two years later. Back in 2003, the children's edutainment company Leapfrog put out a handheld system called the Leapster. A couple years after its launch, a learning game based on the Sonic X show came out. It's a simple game where you play as Sonic and pretty much just have to walk around answering a bunch of baby math. Let me tell you a quick little story about having to get footage for this. Out of the few different versions of the Leapster that were released, only this one called the LMAX version is capable of composite video out. So I had to go out of my way to track one of these down, and after receiving it, it took a little trial and error, but I managed to get it to work. Unfortunately, the footage I captured is interlaced and bounces up and down every frame. I tried to fix it, and I did manage to get it to work for short clips, but when I tried to actually apply it to all of my footage, I sat around for an hour waiting for it to apply, and then this happened. It's okay, 
I didn't need those 65 minutes anyway. Fortunately, at the very last second, I thought to cut the 60 FPS footage down to 30, and that seemed to fix it. You're welcome. Now, as for the game, there isn't really one. Is it technically a game? Yeah, sure. Is it really? Not really. See, there's definitely a couple different ways to go about making an edutainment game, especially one based on a pre-existing property. Either you make a fun game that's actually engaging to play and sprinkle in different learning mechanics naturally, thereby making an actual enjoyable experience, like many of the learning company games from back in the day, or you can just make a bare bones pop quiz with a Sonic the Hedgehog coat of paint. This would be the latter. You basically just walk around the various stages and these giant robots block your path. You answer math problems by selecting the correct numbers and then you can pass. Every so often, you're forcibly transported into a mini game where you need to answer more math problems and once beaten, you're transported back to the stage. It's Eggman Super Sucky Machine. How many rings are there? Despite using Sonic 3 sprites for whatever reason, even though this is based on Sonic X, there's no actual Sonic mechanics here other than being able to jump. There's no spin dash, no attacking at all since there are no real enemies in the game, and you do not run fast at all. As it turns out, Sonic X for the Leapster is actually a reskin of a previous Leapster game called Numbers on the Run Counting on Zero, and now this makes a whole lot more sense. This game was even then reskinned again into a Go Diego Go game. Probably the biggest difference here is that they made these animated cutscenes based on Sonic X that are, um, well, they sure do exist. I'm Chris, a great friend of Sonic the Hedgehog. I'd love to introduce you to him. Someone call my name? Hey, my friends! You're going down, Eggman! <laughs> now, there's three main areas with three stages per area. Think of it as three zones with three acts each. Unfortunately, though, there really isn't much that differs between each act. No real increased challenge outside of the game introducing subtraction in the final zone, but because there are no enemies or physics to speak of, the slight variation in level layout doesn't really change anything worth noting. It kind of just feels like you have to play through the same stage three times. At the end of each zone, you save one of Sonic's friends that have been captured by Eggman, but once you beat the third zone, you just go back to the level map. According to the cutting room floor, there's actually a cut credit sequence, which is kind of odd that it wasn't included. Also, thanks to the cutting room floor, I found out about the hidden cheat menu. So if you start a new file and type in the name .sonster, you unlock a few different cheat options. You can activate a fly slash no clip mode that lets you move Sonic around the stage, kind of like debug mode from the classic Sonic games. Only problem was that I couldn't get it to deactivate, so it was kind of pointless. Also unlockable is a level select menu, which not only gives you access to a test level, but also shows further evidence of this game being built off counting on zero, as the level select menu and level names all still reflect the original game. Not to mention, one of the mini games from counting on zero that I guess was cut is still accessible, but unfortunately trying to actually play it was crashing the game for me. According to the cutting room floor, you can also play as zero, the player character from counting on zero, but I couldn't manage to figure out how to do that. This was all definitely interesting, but I shouldn't need to tell you that you can, um, you can probably go ahead and pass on this one. When the Sony PSP was current, I didn't really know too much about it. I was never a PlayStation guy back then, so it wasn't really in the cards for me to ever get one. I didn't even really know many people who owned one, and I sure as hell never knew about the Sonic games that were released for it, at least not until I was an adult. In 2006, quite the year for Sonic, Sonic Rivals was released for the PSP, and it's honestly a really weird entry in the series. Typically, when you think of an on-foot Sonic racing game, Sonic R usually comes to mind, but they actually took another crack at it with the Rivals series. Unlike Sonic R, though, Sonic Rivals is a 2.5D racing slash platforming game. It's kind of hard to describe. It's not fully a racing game, and it's not fully a platformer. There's four characters you can choose from at the start, with one more being unlockable after you've beaten the game with all four, but uh, I won't be doing that today. And there's slightly different stories for each character. From what I grasp, it's kind of like Sonic Adventure, where the game basically covers perspectives of each character and you get more insight and story info as you complete the game with each respective character. I could be wrong, but that's what I've gotten from it. Because I don't have that kind of time, I only played as Sonic, and I won't be going in depth about the story. But the premise, at least from Sonic's perspective, the Eggman has a camera which can turn anyone into cards. I don't know why the camera turns people into cards and not just, you know, photographs, but that's what we're working with here. 
The main objective is basically just to defeat Eggman and save the characters that have been transformed into cards. However, that's easier said than done, because for the most part, it isn't Eggman you're up against. Each character is after Eggman for their own reasons, and despite all having basically the same goal, they're all at each other's throats trying to be the first one to do it, hence the name of the series. Sounds a lot to me like this plot only exists so that the hero characters have a reason to all be against each other for this one. The normal stages are set up very much like how you'd imagine a hybrid of a Sonic stage and a racing game to be. For the most part, you just hold right and react to your surroundings accordingly. There are boost, power-ups to get the edge on your opponent, little platforming challenges thrown in, and the occasional quick-time button press, which, if failed, can usually go one of two ways. Either you miss out on a power-up or a quicker route, or you straight up fall off the course and lose a bunch of time. Speaking of, the rubber banding in this game is insane. For anyone who isn't aware of what that is, long story short, it's where the game will snap the AI opponent closer to you if you get too far ahead of it. So in this game, it really doesn't matter how good you get, because the better you do, the worse the rubber banding is. For the most part, most of the stages are these races against any of the other characters, but most zones also have boss fights at the end, where, once again, the goal isn't to defeat the boss, but to beat the boss before your rival does. This was actually one of the more enjoyable parts of the game, not that that's really saying much, but I'll get to that. Actually, my favorite part of the game is at the end, where you're no longer racing an opponent, but racing against the clock. I'm not sure what it is, but for whatever reason, I find it way less stressful to beat out a clock rather than an AI opponent. In like any game where I've ever had to do this, I guess it also helps that I can't be pelted with items the entire time I'm trying to run. So like, in concept, this game doesn't sound too bad. In execution though, not so much. Look, I don't think this is a horrible game with no redeeming qualities, but it also isn't a game I'll look back on fondly and want to play again. It's just too clunky. The controls are super loose feeling, and overall the game is just messy. Getting hit and losing time is super frustrating, and the platforming sections, while I get what they were going for, just kind of feel like a pain and bring the pace of the game to a halt. It's a racing game where sometimes you need to randomly stop and platform slowly and precisely with controls that are anything but precise. This game isn't terrible. It's fine, I guess, but it's not something I'd ever call a must-play. Well, they wasted no time, and a year later, Sonic Rivals 2 was released. Now, this game is, for the most part, the same, with a few notable changes. Now, visually, the game looks great, with a lot of good color usage and flashy set pieces, and this time around, you have a choice of eight different characters split up into four teams. You have Sonic and Tails, Shadow and Metal, Knuckles and Rouge, and Espio and Silver. Once again, each party has their own storyline, so again, I won't be going too in-depth into the story, and to be honest, I didn't even pay too much attention for the campaign I did finish, which was Sonic and Tails. Eggman kidnaps a bunch of chow or something, and this big monster called Ifrit is on the brink of being awoken, and now Sonic and Tails need to stop Eggman and defeat Ifrit before it unalives everyone or something. Now, unlike the previous game, there's actually a notable difference between characters. Each character has an ability that can be used after you fill up your special meter, which is filled by collecting rings. Sonic can dash, Tails can fly, Shadow has chaos control, etc. And each one can give you an edge on your opponent during a race. Some powers are more useful than others, though. Like Tails' flight, for example, was mostly useless in comparison to Sonic's dash, so whenever I had to play as Tails, I didn't really use it too much. Now, the boss battles in this game are similar to Rivals 1, only the bosses are way, way cheaper. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. The bosses themselves aren't super cheap. The AI of your opponent who is trying to beat you at taking them down is extremely unfair. These controls were not meant for precise platforming in combat and are super loose and imprecise. The AI, though, has complete, perfect control and can stop on a dime if it needs to. The AI can just straight up do things that you can't and reacts way quicker than you could ever hope to. A lot of these boss fights are getting a hit in during the small window you're able to, and the AI is literally ready at the exact millisecond the attack window opens and, more often than not, immediately reacts to it before you even have a chance. It's all doable, it's just extremely frustrating more often than not. Especially this one boss fight, for example, where you need to attack these flying enemies so they fall and collide with the boss as it goes by. You have to time it precisely during a very quick window, which for you is pretty difficult, but the AI can react to it with perfect timing. And it doesn't help that there's these weird rules that are applied to just this boss. See, normally, the homing attack works against seemingly every other enemy in the game, including your opponent. 
except this one. Every time you use the homing attack on them, you get hurt, while your opponent has no problem attacking them at all. Turns out, they're for some reason immune to the homing attack and hurt you if you try to use it. Instead, you need to use your super slow, floaty, clunky jump to attack them, which only makes the timing even harder. Why? New to Sonic Rivals 2 are these combat stages. Basically, each zone has four acts. One race, one fight against another character, another race using the other character in your team, and then another boss fight. These combat acts are pretty cheap as well, but as long as you're aggressive, they aren't usually too bad. Usually. The game gives you these giant arenas to fight in, but honestly, the more time you spend keeping your distance, the more of a chance your opponent has to grab offensive items and use them on you. The best strategy I've found is literally just closing the gap and being as aggressive as possible to take them out as fast as you can. Anyway, that's basically it. There's some other stuff like multiplayer modes, but I couldn't try any of that out. Rivals 2 is marginally better than Rivals 1, but that's not really saying too much. The music is better, though it still has random music and sound effects from the first game, which were reused, and it's actually quite a bit jarring to hear random old songs from the first game in the context of the new soundtrack. Like, it's fine, it's just really weird because they're totally different styles. This is another one you can skip over to, honestly. If you're a diehard Sonic fan and want to try these out, I'd say go for it, but you really aren't missing anything if you pass on the Rival series. In 2008, Leapfrog came out with yet another handheld gaming device called the Didge, and with it came another Sonic-themed edutainment game, this time just called Sonic the Hedgehog. Unfortunately for me, the Didge never released a model that could do video output, so I had to film less than ideal footage of it. Initially, I put the console on a stand so I could hold it steady while my camera was on a tripod, but uh, the stand broke. Apparently, there's a way to mod these things to do composite, but it's very involved and requires solder work to be done to the main CPU, and I'm not trying to do all that. So I had to go with this shoddy camera recording of a shaky screen, is what I would say if a kind soul didn't reach out to me and offer me capture footage of the game, which surprisingly has not already been properly captured and uploaded on YouTube. Definitely sucks that I already sat there filming the stupid screen, but now we have actual footage, so hooray! Sonic the Hedgehog for the Didge is a spelling game designed for kids 7 to 10. Apparently, you could hook the system up to a computer and download a database of 10,000 words, but once again, not going out of my way to do all that, and plus, I doubt that feature even works now anyway. Let me just be frank with what this game is. It's this weird Frankenstein's monster of elements from Sonic 1, 2, and 3, and the stages are extremely confusing in how they're structured. The first stage says Green Hill Zone, right? But aesthetically, it's actually Emerald Hill Zone and uses Emerald Hill's assets. Then stage two is Emerald Hill Zone? There are no acts, so each level is a new zone, with the exception of the first two, who for some reason use all the same level assets, okay? Also featured are Sandopolis, Hydro City, Scrap Brain, Chemical Plant, and Egg Base Zone, which is really just Death Egg Zone. For whatever reason, each stage sometimes features music from other stages, and sometimes they don't. It's kind of a crapshoot. For example, Sandopolis' music plays during Sandopolis, but it also plays during Hydro City. And Green Hill Zone, which is actually Emerald Hill Zone, plays Mushroom Hill Zone from Sonic & Knuckles, despite not even being in the game. Literally none of this makes sense at all. The levels are mostly completely redesigned. There's a couple locales that I recognize here and there, but for the most part, it's all new. I might as well get this out of the way and explain the spelling part of this. Basically, in each stage, there's any number of what look to be special stage rings. Sometimes they block your path entirely, and some need to be sought out intentionally. What they really are, though, are these extremely simple spelling minigames. There's a couple that aren't too bad, but... There's one that's extremely frustrating where you need to jump on these monitors with the correct letters to spell a word. And the reason this is the frustrating one is because of the controls and hitboxes, which make it annoyingly difficult to actually break the monitors, but I'll talk about that a little more in a second. The other two are just these simple complete the word games and don't take much actual dexterity to complete and only really challenge your spelling knowledge. My main problem with this, though, is just the fact that it doesn't really teach you anything. It's like studying with flashcards without actually teaching the player how to spell in the first place. There's no way this game taught any kid how to spell and only really serves as a pop quiz for something kids have already learned in school. Now, as for the actual platforming gameplay, it surprisingly has more actual video game in here than I expected. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. None of this is good. 
The hitboxes are so tiny while Sonic's hurtbox is large, so a lot of the times you'll lose your rings in some pretty cheap ways. The physics are all sorts of f***ed up. Sonic controls very erratically in like the weirdest way too. Like tapping forward makes you go from standing to full speed way too quickly, but also Sonic's top speed is extremely slow. So it's too slow to be a proper Sonic run speed, but too fast to be precise when you need it to be. Bottomless pits are absent, even in areas where they're supposed to be. Luckily, despite the jank, you can still cheese bosses, which was shocking to me because the bosses are the only thing in this game I can seem to chain bounces off of. There's also some weird programming stuff going on sometimes, like how I guess all springs react when you use one. Despite all this though, I was surprised that it leaned more into being an actual Sonic game where you need to run through stages and defeat bosses with platforming video game mechanics. Like, I'd assume a game like this would just make you spell words to defeat Eggman or something, but nope. It's all terrible, but at the very least, it's actually a video game and not just a spelling test with Sonic the Hedgehog's face slapped on it. The last stage also surprisingly was just a Death Egg robot fight from Sonic 2, only, um, well. If I'm being quite honest, this was for the most part, well, a giant heap of garbage. I mean, if I'm being as fair as humanly possible, the Rival series isn't completely terrible. I mean, it's playable, it isn't broken, and I'm sure you can find some fun in it, but it's also janky and nothing to really write home about. Save for Sonic Pocket Adventure, most of these are better left unplayed. I had to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to cover these, and it's probably for good reason. Sonic Pocket Adventure, though, that's a, that's a must-play, I think. I knew going into this that it was one of the better ones, but honestly, it's better than most of any of the other handheld Sonic games, and as we've now seen, I've played literally all of them. Honestly, I think I liked it more than even something as polished as the Sonic Advance series. It's just so simple and straightforward, and it just works. But then again, I'm also Sonic 2 biased. Well, that's it. I've finally covered what I hope is all the main handheld Sonic games. If you've been along for the ride the entire time, I can't thank you enough for watching, and if this is the first one you've seen, or even the first video of mine you've seen, maybe go back and check out the other ones, which I assume maybe you'd want to if you stuck around till this far into the video. I've played a whole lot of Sonic games over the years, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's that Sonic doesn't always get it right, and to be fair, saying that is a pretty big understatement. But when he does get it right, boy does he nail it. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, there's a couple other videos right there you can check out. And if you want to see everything I upload, subscribe and then tap the bell icon. And if you want to help support the channel, I also have a Patreon right there too.